Okay, I believe we can get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ellie Murphy, and I am the Senior Advisor of Women and International Relations um, out of the Institute of Global Leadership. Welcome to today's discussion with Ambassador Caroline Kennedy. Ambassador Kennedy is an attorney and the author and editor of 11 books on law, civics, and poetry. She worked for 10 years with the New York City Department of Education before serving as the United States Ambassador to Japan between 2013 and 2017, the first woman to do so. As ambassador, Ms. Kennedy supported the economic empowerment of women and worked to increase student exchange between the United States and Japan. She's the founder of the International Poetry Exchange Program, which brings together students from Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and New York City. One of the members of Tufts Women in International Relations, Mika, will be hosting and moderating today's discussion. Um, the chat function is disabled, so if you have any questions, be sure to post them in the Q&A function. And now it is my absolute honor to introduce Ambassador Kennedy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Ellie, for introducing uh, Ambassador Kennedy. And hello, Ambassador, it's so nice to see you. Um, and thank you again so much for coming us to um, talk today. Um, yes, and with Ellie's reminder, please use the Q&A uh, feature to put in your questions. So as Ellie mentioned earlier, other than being a diplomat, you are or have worked as an author, uh, an attorney, editor, and most notably a poet. Um, and you have published multiple books, one being a collection of poems written by female poets of your choosing and including, I think, I believe your mother's work as well and your mother's poems. Um, and, it, and it explores various facets of womanhood. And I know that you grew up writing and reading, um, listening to poetry. So it's something important in your life. And um, so having these experiences and including the other professions, professions I mentioned earlier, um, how have they influenced your work and attitude towards diplomacy or just life in general? And if so, how? Uh, well, uh, I think poetry has been called the language of the human heart. And I think that it really condenses all our experiences uh, into sort of their essence. And um, I grew up, I was lucky to have uh, parents who really cared about uh, words and really believe that ideas can change the world. And, and I was exposed to reading. My mother loved poetry and made it part of our everyday life uh, in a way. So I, it wasn't intimidating for me. Um, and I found actually that um, it not only did it teach me to listen, uh, because I feel like if you are reading something that somebody has taken uh, the time to really think about, um, you're really learning about them. You have a very direct connection uh, and understand um, and be open to others. But it also teaches you to find your own voice because you have to think uh, for, your own, for yourself about what's most important to you. And, um, and I feel like in times that are difficult, like, like now, um, that it's, a, it's something you can always fall back on. It's always poems that you responded to that you know or um, really are with you all the time. And so I, I found that it, um, it is a great way. It, it's helped me express my own, myself as well as, um, I mean, I'm not a great poet, but I, I respect um, that kind of intensity. And I feel like it really uh, elevates the importance of the individual. And I think that that's something that is very, very important in international relations and in human relations uh, as well. So I, for all those reasons, I really like it. And um, when I was in Japan, I started a program to connect um, American high school students with high school students in Japan. And then we added Korea and the Philippines. And it's, it's a spoken word poem. And I think that spoken word is a great American art form now. And poetry is not a solitary thing. And so um, the kids in the other countries are excited to hear practitioners of spoken word and have a poetry slam. And then the American students are interested in how 
students from other cultures express themselves, all the other kinds of poet poetry around the world. So I think it's been a way to really bring people together and write about sort of common experiences like friendship or family or school or pressure uh, and then uh, see how much we have in common and it makes it fun when we have a chance to meet each other as well. Um, so, so it's a way of connecting that I think is um, beyond politics. Right, I remember you were, um, I think, I believe you were like a judge for like a poem competition. Is that the same program? I'm not really. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And then we have a, a competition uh, every year and, um, and uh, it's a lot of fun because you see the kids from the different countries are all wanna win. And, um, and then the winner always shares a song, K-pop or J-pop or, you know, hip hop. So, um, so it's, it's, I think it's taught us all, I've learned a lot from, from the students and I think they have from each other. Oh, that's wonderful. And right, so I'm, I'm part of this or student organization, Women and I are here at Tufts, which um, aims to create a community of intellectually curious and strong femme identifying students interested in studying uh, international relations with the emphasis on building a safe space for dialogue, empowerment, and career building for women. And it's in truth, it's kind of sad that there even has to be like a movement like this, but there's so many obstacles that have been put in place deliberately to discriminate and hold back marginalized groups such as women and BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color um, in the field of international diplomacy. Um, have you faced these barriers? And if so, how have you overcome them? Well, I agree with you that they exist. I um, and have intentionally and unintentionally been put in place, I think. I think that it's almost even worse that um, they people just assume that, that this is completely normal and um, over time. And so there is a, a huge effort now and a huge um, need to uh, correct uh, that imbalance. And um, so I really congratulate everybody in this group and in larger IR field of uh, women who want to pursue this career because I think it's so important that our countries are represented by um, the full spectrum of their citizens and uh, certainly that more than includes women, um, we should be the majority. Um, I, as you know, was fortunate to serve as President Obama's ambassador to Japan, the first woman. And, um, and I didn't work my way up through the diplomatic service, um, but I certainly worked with many, many women who were just incredibly talented. And um, the State Department has historically not been as welcoming as it should be, although there have been significant efforts off and on to, um, to encourage women and, and advance them. And um, there are many, many talented women, but there needs to be more. So, um, but just in terms of that, the, the head of the political section, the head of the economic section, um, my chief of staff and um, the head of the public affairs section, all were women when I was in Tokyo. And I think that that um, actually was a very uh, sent a real message in Japan um, to have uh, when I went to present my credentials to become ambassador to the emperor the whole slate of that went with me were allowed to bring four people were all women so I think that that there is change and I think that um, places like Japan uh, do look to the United States even though um, we certainly have a long way to go in terms of um, women being represented at the highest levels. Um, but I think things like having a woman vice president does send a powerful signal around the world, even though here we feel that it's still not enough and we know exactly, you know, that, it, um, that we need more. So, um, so I think there is some, something, some pride that we should take uh, in that. I certainly saw that Japan um, has just an unbelievable number of dynamic, incredibly well-educated, ambitious, energetic, creative you know, women, and that the key to uh, the Japanese economy is going to be to figure out how to 
empower them and make it possible for them to fully participate, which they're currently really unable to do. So, um, so I think that change is slow and the people who have the power don't wanna give it up, but um, I, I bet on Japanese women any day and I um, really tried to do everything I could to help them and support uh, their efforts. Right. And, you know, speaking of strong, influential women, there are many of us here today that look up to you, including myself, um, as someone who has done <laughs> extraordinary work in education, uh, foreign service, and also, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <laughs> and um, also breaking social barriers, you know, such as being the first female U.S. ambassador to Japan. Um, I know that there has been many strong and influential woman figures in your life. Um, so I'm wondering who's one that you look up to and how have they impacted you? Well, I, I was lucky in my family. If people think of the Kennedy family as being uh, all about the men um, who achieved these great, this great success. But in my experience, it was really the women who were um, the, my role models and the people that I looked up to. And I was fortunate to have uh, my grandmother who um, was the, per the best politician in our family. And I think everybody knew that. And she was, uh, had been campaigning since she was uh, in high school, first for her father and later for her sons. And I think in a different time, uh, probably would have been for herself. But uh, she really believed deeply that we all have um, not only, not an obligation, but it's our great honor and privilege to serve and our country. And she um, was endlessly curious, um, very self-disciplined, a woman of deep faith and commitment. And so I, I feel like her example and the fact that she never ever, um, you know, act, had a hard day and just always kept working to make things better was a great example for me. And, um, and all of her children obviously uh, she set an example as well. My aunt Eunice founded Special Olympics. And I think it was a testament to her, her mother, my grandmother, um, but also to her own sense of justice because my uh, aunt, another aunt uh, was intellectu born intellectually disabled. And I think Eunice really felt that there was just a great injustice in this. And um, she created the Special Olympics starting in her backyard and it grew, um, to encompass 4 million athletes around the world now. And um, I think that that just shows you what, um, what women and others, obviously she, she knew how to get everyone else to help her, particularly her brothers, but um, can accomplish. And it goes way beyond politics. And I think it's one of the legacies of our family that is um, the one that I am you know, proudest of. And it resonates around the world, I certainly, saw in Japan, I tried to also uh, reach out uh, and give more visibility to the <clears throat> advocates for disability rights, um, because I think that population um, in many countries, including Japan, is stigmatized and um, invisible. And I think, um, so I, I feel like I've had great role models who just didn't ever take no for an answer and kept pushing and persevering um, because they believed in something that was larger than themselves. I think that's something that's really important as, as women, we try to um, advance and pursue the opportunities and the careers that we want. Um, if you feel that you're really working for something larger than yourself, I think it really helps sustain you through uh, the difficult times that will come to everyone. Right, and that actually kind of somewhat like leads to my next question. So we're gonna go back in a little uh, history for a bit. Um, Eugenie Anderson was the first American female ambassador, um, first as the US ambassador to Denmark and later became the US minister to Bulgaria. Um, and there's a quote that she has famously said when she was the US minister to Bulgaria. Um, I think it was an interview, uh, which was quote, I think I convinced them that I was not going to be just a gentle woman that they can push around, end quote. Do you or have you resonated with these words and um, what did you do to overcome um, and deal with challenges that you encountered in this still very much you know, male dominated career field? Um, well, um, 
it matters that you are not a gentlewoman that they can put you around, but it sometimes is okay if they think that you might be. Um, so I feel like I, um, I certainly have the greatest admiration for people um, who serve and, um, and were the first in a time when that was really an even more extraordinary accomplishment. Um, I, in Japan, I certainly, um, I didn't experience anything like people saying, you know, were overtly discriminating uh, against me to my face, but I, um, I know uh, what they were saying. I mean, I, I got it in a more subtle form, which was, you know, your predecessors were Walter Mondale and Mike Mansfield and Howard Baker, uh, all of whom have been Senate majority leaders or vice president. Um, and um, uh, well, Tom Foley. Um, and so oh, how does that make you feel? How can you sleep at night? That was the question. And I, and so I said, well, it, it makes me feel like a woman. So, uh, and everybody would look very uncomfortable and nervous. And, um, but I think that I had a few experiences early on, which, um, which were not, which I thought were problematic, but over the long run, I think turned out to be, um, helpful, uh, in that, uh, early on in my tenure, uh, I remember it was like a month and a half after I arrived in Japan and Mika will understand this, but people like president Obama and former president Clinton had said to me, Japan is just the most foreign place that you could go. And so everything there is just going to be different and it's going to be very complicated for you to understand what's happening. And so it was a Friday afternoon and in January and I arrived in late November and um, some people in the embassy were really uh, upset as well as I was hearing from my children overseas about the dolphin hunt, um, that the brutal dolphin hunting that was going on. And uh, there was an environmental woman officer and wanted to put out a statement. So nobody was really around. And um, so we thought that this was a great idea and we went ahead and she was responsible for clearing it back in Washington, which she did. And um, I think that nobody, it wasn't any big deal, except for that it then went uh, viral around the world and became a huge um, statement. And, um, and many of the people in the State Department were extremely upset because you're not supposed to criticize your host government and your, your that country, you do that in private, which is obviously the right way to go. But, um, we didn't think anyone would pay much attention. <laughs> so, so, um, so I got in trouble. And um, even though I had done everything right and we had cleared it, but of course, once it became a big deal, everybody said we hadn't cleared it, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I, I was, you know, then I felt like this is terrible. I just started here and now look what I've done. Um, but in fact, what I realized later also was it gave me a lot more power. Um, and it made people pay attention um, because they didn't want me to do any more tweets <laughs> about, about them. And so I always tried to um, conduct uh, any difficult uh, business um, in private, but um, I think everybody knew that if I really um, wanted to, I could um, have a much more public profile. And so I think it really helped people take me seriously in a way um, that, um, that I didn't realize at the very beginning. So I think it's good to have, to not have people as you, to echo what the pioneering woman ambassador said, um, be a little bit scared of you, even though um, it depends what your position is, when that's a good idea and who is a good idea to have in that category. But um, I think it's a good thing. And, you know, as someone myself who identifies as a woman, um, specifically woman of color, um, I often find myself, you know, not only facing external barriers and obstacles, but also internal barriers. And that includes, you know, the, the anxiety of being, you know, the only woman in the room or in a male dominated space and my own thoughts holding me back from speaking up 
but you know, really seeing and learning about all the women leaders and strong figureheads I've met in my life, it gives me really a uh, confidence and inspiration. So I, just I think if you focus on the people that are right there in front of you and you try to, uh, you know, change the mind of one person in a room and then, you know, uh, one person kind of, on, you know, in a larger place and one at a time, you build up the confidence and the practice of how to do that in a way that is successful and brings people along with you because um, that's really what you want to do, I think. And I think when, um, I think I found actually that I, I really felt like my job, certainly as ambassador, somebody who hadn't spent their whole career, you know, in the diplomatic service was really to empower everyone else to be able to do their job better. So if I could help them have access or uh, help them advance an issue by um, participating in some way at, at a certain point, um, that, was, that was the best thing that I could do was to strengthen um, everyone else around me. And it's hard to balance that because at certain, depending on where you are in your career and your life and your position, um, you need to strengthen yourself um, and your own position, but uh, you also need to strengthen your team and those around you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, now I kind of want to shift gears a bit and um, ask what you think about the current situations or changes that the US is currently going through. Um, what do you think are some challenges that the US is facing or is going to face with um, international cooperation and diplomacy going forward, um, especially with the new administration um, attempting to kind of regain, um, or, you know, resolidify their their trust and for their role in the international world. Uh, well, I think the rest of the world, you know, it's been head spinning to watch the United States over the last um, five years go from uh, one extreme to the other, and um, so I think that there is a lot of you know, people have questions about our reliability, our strength, our ability to execute on our long-term goals, our national sense of purpose and unity. And, um, and so certainly for countries in Asia that are um, also geographically and economically how much very close or closer to China, um, they don't want to be forced to choose. And so I think to navigate the, um, the rise of China, the, um, the future of the United States, um, the partisanship here where um, is very, very, it's a real challenge. It's incredibly interesting time and um, incredibly important. And so the United States, I think, I mean, personally, obviously I'm, um, I'm really impressed with what the new administration is doing, and I think its goal is to empower and strengthen um, our allies and partners. And um, but I think people still understandably have a lot of questions about um, do we mean it this time, and might we go back to something uh, they don't recognize? So um, so I think it so I think it could not be a more interesting time for all of you to be entering this field. There's so much to do. Right. And as someone who represented the United States for in Japan uh, for three years, you know that Japan is America's one of the um, strongest allies, especially in East Asia. Um, how do you think the change, again, in our administration, oh, and also Japan's uh, change in administration from Prime Minister Abe to Suga, um, how do you think this will impact US-Japan relations? Uh, well, I think that, um, first of all, I think Japan is our most important ally right now. And the new prime minister of Japan um, is going to be the first foreign leader to meet um, President Biden at the White House since he became president. So that just shows you um, how important this alliance is. And um, I think on the Japan side, there's a lot of continuity between former prime minister and um, the new prime minister. Um, I think that a lot was made by President Trump of 
his relationship with Japan and Prime Minister Abe, and obviously we all watched him, you know, meet with the North Korea dictator and try to, you know, and um, pull out of Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, take China on in a much more aggressive way. And um, I think depending, uh, but I don't think even though Japan was um, relatively speaking fared well, I don't think actually the, the, the US-Japan relationship was strengthened um, during that time. So I think that uh, there's still work that needs to be done to restore that, but I think there, the Japanese and the United States governments are have really experienced it working together. There's strong you know, friendships and relationships among the US and Japanese military and intelligence communities, as well as in business. Japan's the biggest uh, foreign investor in the United States. Um, and we have great business in Japan. So I think that that, that relationship is only gonna become more important. I think it's gonna be difficult uh, for Japan to manage uh, sort of the United States that is um, much more eager to call people out around the world for human rights violations, for example, um, because that's not traditionally the way that they operate. Um, so there's a lot of complexity to these relationships, certainly in something that is as multifaceted as the US Japan, but Japan is the second biggest donor to the UN. They're our partner in outer space. They're our partner in ocean exploration and climate uh, change uh, advancement, you know, battle. So I think that's all going to go very well. Um, but I think that uh, in the region, is, everything is shifting. And that's a complicated thing for both governments to na navigate. Right. And um, in, in 2014, you visited the city of Nago in Okinawa um, during a pretty contentious time when there were massive disputes and, well, there, it, it might say like the, the problem is still going on um, among the native citizens of Okinawa and about the presence of American troops on their land and uh, the conflicts that are occurring there. Do you believe Okinawa can play a a key role in mitigating the ongoing tension. So in other words, how do you think the two countries can solve this issue? Um, whether that's like through local community efforts um, and maintaining the deterrence of US forces in Japan against immediate threats, like, as you said before, like Chinese aggression um, we've been seeing recently. Uh, well, um, I don't know how much everybody else knows about um, about the US presence in Okinawa, but um, Japan is a country where the United States has the most troops stationed overseas. Um, and there are 50, about 50,000 of them, uh, active duty troops that um, uh, respond all over the Indo-Pacific. Um, and they're stationed in Okinawa, which is an island off the Southern coast of Japan that has a very, very strategic location because it's um, it can, you can get to Taiwan, China, Korea, um, all quite easily from there, Philippines. So um, it was, um, and we, we kept it after the war and we um, occupied it until the 1970s and we still have um, most of our bases there. Uh, and obviously that places a great burden on the local population, um, but the United States is committed to the defense of Japan, uh, so so it's complicated because um, it's even if you think we shouldn't do things like that, um, Japan is um, depends on us, and so the really the real complexity comes from the relationship between the local Okinawan people um, and their central government, as well as the U.S government and the Japanese government. And then the third leg of it is really that the, the local impact of the troops and their behavior um, really is felt only by the local Okinawan population who um, has borne the brunt of this. And from time to time, uh, there are terrible, horrific incidents that really cause uh, 
tremendous um, difficulty um, in the larger relationship just from individual behavior. So I think that the United States military needs to do a better job and they try, but um, they could do a lot better. And I think that the, um, the, the Japanese government is working toward a solution not to move some of the most, uh, the bases that are in the most crowded area, but it's, they've been, we've been working on it for 20 years and they're still sitting exactly where they were. So it just shows you in a really concentrated way how things that are globally important which is, let's say, the United States you know, deterrence and the maintenance of stability and uh, in the entire Asia Pacific region is actually uh, felt locally by the people on the islands of Okinawa. And, um, and so that's very, very uh, disproportionate. But, um, and so far, Nobody has really felt that the status quo, except for, uh, on the uh, government to government, U.S. or Japanese central government area is bad enough to actually change, make a dramatic change. And, um, and I understand why the Okinawan people want that dramatic change, and I, um, and I understand why it's difficult to accomplish it. But as ambassador, it was really one of the most difficult issues emotionally as well as historically and um, diplomatically because um, the status quo is, is very hard to change. And no matter what you think, there is a policy in place and, um, and it's gonna take a long time. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I know it, Okinawa, the Okinawa issue is, um, is very very complex and I don't know I was I was talking to my dad about it and it's it's such a like there can be it, it's just gonna go on and on and it's I don't know it's it's a very um unfortunately it feels very pessimistic where you can only hold pessimistic views but um, yeah I I there's a really good book that somebody uh that a, a young fairly young woman writer just wrote um I don't know if any of you or would be called speak Okinawa and it's uh, an American girl um, grew up in the suburbs, I think uh, New York and New Jersey, but her mother is from Okinawa and had worked in a nightclub and met her father who's a serviceman and fought in Vietnam. And then uh, came to America and the mother family had been desperately poor in Okinawa. So she was uh, really eager to come to the United States, um, but then her daughter, you know, didn't really want to have a mother who didn't speak English and um, and all and didn't fit in. And so uh, it took her a long time to really appreciate her mother's suffering and sacrifice and the history of um, kind of the war and, um, and U.S. imperialism, if you will, um, that and how that played out just in their own family. Um, so it's a really interesting and well done, I thought, very personal memoir of kind of the impacts over time of going back to World War II of how that plays out in different generations of women and, um, and family. So I think, you know, you guys might find it interesting. Great. Thank you. I will, yeah, I will definitely look into it. Um, so because time's we're getting close to the end. I'm gonna just switch it over to Emily with um, some questions that she has from the audience and also just um, some other questions from us. Yes, thank you so much. So for the first question from the audience, um, this is from Alyssa. How do you see Japan's declining birth rates and aging population impacting Japan's role in the international community? Uh, well, this is um, a absolute number one issue um, for for Japan, for the government um, and the society, and they are, um, I think, addressing it in ways that are really interesting. And it's an issue that China is going to face. It's an issue that the United States um, will possibly face. It's hard to you know predict things um, because they have 
historically not had um, any really immigration and they have not really empowered women. So in one way it could be an opportunity for women to advance because they're much more necessary now in the workforce. And there are some estimates that say that um, because of the declining population, if women are empowered, it could raise GDP by 12%, for example. So that's a big incentive for everyone to make um, a change. Um, but, and on the other hand, they are also much um, more willing to um, invest in um, robotics and they don't see um, that, let's say, as taking jobs away from people because they need more workers. So, um, and they need foreigners to come and work in Japan. So it's possible that some of those, um, uh, to, you know, requirements are going to are going to transform Japan in ways that um, will accelerate the progress for women in particular. It's possible that um, that they won't, but I think that the government is trying to uh, make it easier for women to um, to support childcare and to support uh, families. Um, and so it's easy to talk about discrimination in Japan, but one of the things that I found really interesting was their different attitude towards, for example, um, maternal leave. In Japan, the um, maternity leave is three years um, by the law, and um, you don't have to take all that, and obviously most people don't, um, and it leads to, you know, maybe resentment among coworkers, but if you want to talk about the U.S. versus Japan, and um, while it seems like women here have perhaps um, an easier time advancing. There's just certainly a lot of support there for um, women and families um, in that way. So it's, everybody solves these problems differently. And I think you, you know, by spending time in other countries, you see how they do that and what's good about the different approaches and, and what's not. So, um, so I think it's a problem. I think there are they know it's a problem and they're coming up with their own uh, sets of solutions. I, I mean, there are some that I think they should accelerate, but, um, but it'll be interesting to see because when China hits that demographic wall, that is gonna really be, um, have a major impact on the global economy. Thank you. And our next question, which was done by an anonymous attendee, said, most of us here are IR majors getting ready to enter the international sphere, whether through an internship or a full-time career. If you had to give one or two pieces of, pieces of advice for people about to enter the IR field, what would it be? Uh, well, uh, the, you may, you're making a great decision, so you should absolutely uh, stick with it. It's absolutely, I think, the I mean, spending time in other countries, other cultures, learning other languages uh, is going to be absolutely critical to the future and success of the United States. So the more experiences you can have, the more chances you can have to work with um, people in other countries um, to learn their languages, to solve problems in different contexts, um, I think the better, you know, the, the better your chances will be of having a successful career and a rewarding life. So I congratulate you all. And I would just try to do as many different things as possible um, and certainly spend as much time in as many other cultures as you can. Even if you can't travel now, um, you know, there are many opportunities in the US to spend time in other cultures, which I think is one of the really extraordinary things about our country that, um, that I think, and I think it also gives you a chance to see America from many different perspectives and that will inform your choices as you go forward in your life as well. Okay, we have one more question and about two more minutes left. So if we can answer that, we can end on a good note. This comes from Mira in around June, 2020, Japan reviewed its space policy and said it would increase cooperation with the United States in light of what they called a growing threat from North Korea and China. Could you speak more about how the US and Japan are navigating the growing strength of the US-Russia bloc or the China-Russia bloc in the outer space domain? Well, I think historically the United States and other countries, but we've obviously had the lead, 
um, have been committed to um, the peaceful use of space, the peaceful exploration of space. And it's, I think one of the reasons um, that people look to the International Space Station and others is that, you know, you get people from all these countries that don't get along on Earth and you put um, the astronauts on the International Space Station and they seem to be able to cooperate to accomplish goals together. And, um, and it's sort of an inspiring um, model for Spaceship Earth. But uh, Japan and the United States have been cooperating in space for um, many, many years. And I think what we're talking about doing now is not only um, kind of uh, space exploration, which Japan is strengthening and they're doing asteroids and sending missions um, to study uh, the moon, et cetera, but also uh, intelligence sharing, intelligence gathering, satellites that are able to you know, spy or have great resolution and the positioning of those. And so, um, but I think that the US and Japan are both committed to um, the peaceful use of space, but we, there's no treaties, there's no real governance in space. And I think that this is an area um, that is increasingly dangerous and um, other countries are not necessarily committed uh, to that. And, and I think the fact that we created the space force, um, which was, you know, in the works as an idea before President Trump, but um, I think sent a big signal to the other countries that the Americans might be changing uh, their philosophy. And I think we're, uh, we see it as defensive, but when you add it to cyber and cyber warfare and um, we need Japan, Japan and the US need each other. We're highly advanced um, technical societies and, um, and we haven't spent the same amount of time and effort as the Chinese and the North Koreans in hacking and, um, and those kinds of crimes, but that's all coming and that's gonna be huge for your generation in the IR space because whether it's, it's outer space, there's no governance, there's cyber, there's no real uh, rules of the road. Um, all of that is just um, happening before our very eyes, whether we saw it with solar winds, we've seen it with the election, we've seen, you know, it's a really cost-effective way to attack the United States, um, but Russia and China has a lot of other ways, whether it's in their digital currency that's going to bypass the dollar or, um, putting up all these spy satellites and satellites that can interfere with our GPS and all of that. So, so this is an incredibly complex, incredibly interesting and incredibly important area that, um, that you guys are going to have to deal with. So um, good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. And with that, I will pass it back off to Mika to wrap up the event. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kennedy, for speaking with us today. Yeah, I'm just gonna echo what Emily just said. Thank you so much um, for talking about your experiences as being the US ambassador to Japan and it really what it means to be um, a woman working in, in IR um, and facilitating these conversations. So thank you so much. Um, I hope you have a great day. <laughs> well, having the US government you know, behind you as a woman is a really powerful thing. And so um, I think for those of you who are thinking of going into government, you will see that and uh, and also, you know, NGOs and other um, really need people who are able to um, function um, in different cultures and have the kind of background and knowledge that you all are getting. So uh, um, no matter what you choose to do, uh, it's a great time to be in this field. And um, I wish you all the great success and, um, and good luck. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, well, great. Well, have a great weekend. Thank you. You too as well. <laughs> okay. Happy Patriots Day up there. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.